I guess before everyone sees it, uh, Madam Chair, do you want me to just, there's a lot of co color coding in here because uh, yeah. of different proposals and I am not sure what was, um, what the committee, if the committee has made any decisions yet. So for the purposes of right now, should I just do the new language that's in green that you were referencing that was, that was just decided? Yeah, or that I would just that, come up with. Sorry. I think that that would make the most sense so that we can okay. start with the newest because we've already walked through yeah. the other language. We haven't made decisions about many of them, but we have had, you have given them to us. And, but so if you can do the, mine isn't color coded here, but I think it's green. <laughs> I think yeah, I know it, what they are. It's interesting on the iPad, the color doesn't come through. I opened it on the iPad. So I have to open it on a laptop for it to come for the, color well she will also tell us which section the changes are in so no, it's, it's interesting which technology does what all right does everybody have this now and is it posted yep. okay great <coughs> so becky if you want to walk us through the for the new so kind of the, new the changes yeah. yeah the changes were all in section 10 which um i think this is just an issue with my our, our system here, but for some reason, the page numbers are now gone from again from this document, even though I had added them back into another version. Um, so the, the changes are in um, the pension task force section of the bill, which um, um, it looks like is starting on page 18, if you're able to scroll through on the, an iPad to that. Um, is it, it's section 10. Section 10, yeah. Just go to and, section 10, that then you can figure it out. Yeah, so the changes are section 10, subsection C. So this is the powers and the duties of the task force. Um, so I've tried to highlight in green all of the, the new language. Although if you're not seeing the highlighting, there's some things in other colors. So <laughs> it might be confusing, but um, the, the first change is in subdivision A, 1A. Right. Um, so this previously referred to changing the ADAC and the um, actuarial accrued liabilities for each system based on the difference between fiscal year 21 and 22. Um, that in the most recent uh, actuarial uh, report, um, so this is, and, and setting a pension stabilization target number based on that. So this is um, being a little more prescrip prescriptive with uh, actual numbers. So putting those, the number, the target numbers in there. Um, so the language has the task force recommending options to lower the ADEC and the unfunded actuarial accrued liability based on actuarial value of assets by 25, 50, 75, and 100% of the size of the increases um, from fiscal year 21 to 22, as reported in the actuarial valuation review um, in 2020. Um, so I've, I've laid out here what those numbers actually were for the teachers and the employees <coughs> systems, the state employee systems. So it gives actual numbers for what those 25, 50, 75, and 100% on values are. So you'll see for the teachers, for the ADAC, it's um, 16 million, 32.1 million, 48.1 million, and then 64.1. And for the unfunded accrued liabilities, it's um, 94.7, 189.4, 284.1 million and then 378.8 million. And then the state employees system, um, the numbers are also presented here. It's um, for ADAC 9 million, 18.1 million, 27.1 million and 36.1 million. And then the unfunded accrued liabilities is uh, 56.3 million, 112.5 million, 168.8 million and then 225 million. Um, the next new language is, uh, I also, just for context here, I also switched around the order to try to make it flow a little better um, because a, a number of duties were added and I, they didn't seem to 
be, you know, chronological in any way. So um, some of the some of the stuff that is isn't necessarily new, just in a different order in this list. Um, but sub subdivision B is new, and that is recommending options to increase the funded ratios by. 15% for the teacher system and 10% for the state employees system by fiscal year 27. Um, C is not new. So this is um, having the task force do a five year review of benefit expenditure levels, um, as well as employer employee contribution levels and growth rates on a three, five and 10 year projection of these levels and rates. D and E are both new. Um, so D is identifying potential options for limiting the growth in the ADAC to no more than inflation, and then assessing the impacts associated with any modifications to the current amortization schedule. Um, F is, uh, this, this was in the language before, but some um, language changes were made here. So F is looking at based on the benefit and funding benchmarks, um, a proposed benefit structure that would look at a shared risk model for employer and employee contributions and cost of living adjustments. And what was added here is um, having a focus on reducing any future increases to the actuarial determined employer contributions. Um, oh, I see there's an extra and here that needs to be removed. Um, then it's looking at an, an estimate of the cost of current and any proposed benefit structures on a budgetary pay-as-you-go and full actuarial accrual basis. Um, looking at the state's pension contributions as a percentage of direct general spending in comparison of other state pension contributions. And then this last one is new language, which is um, how proposed benefit changes for new members may reduce the impact of future actuarial assumption losses. Sorry, I see there's mistakes, which is what happens when I try to do things fast. But um, <laughs> so G, there's two Gs, G and the second G, which is really an H. Um, those are the, those are not new, um, so I can skip over those. And then what is labeled as H, which I guess should be I, is um, so a plan for pre-funding OPEB, looking at um, how federal funds can be used. That was there, but what's been added here is that it uh, also looking at um, identifying long long term impacts of pay as you go funding for OPEB. Um, and then there were no other changes to the task force duties. Um, but I can also go over any of the other language if that would be helpful. So <clears throat> are there questions about these, um, we have both Chris um, and Tom who had some input into this here with us to answer any questions. Yes, Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm trying to understand the difference between the two Romanettes that were in the House version and what appears now in a, in a real simplified, easy to understand fashion if that's possible. In, you mean with F, subdivision in F, A? In F or in A? Um, I've got to go back to the document now. I think A had the two the two Romanettes. Yeah. So F, I didn't, I didn't F, really know that was a word, but. I... <laughs> it is. It, we learned it from Tucker. OK. <laughs> I there, learned something there new. Roman numerals, and there, then there are Romanettes. OK. Okay, there you go. Um, so A had the two Romanettes. Um, and, and actually F does too. Uh, well, F has, I think in the in the house pass version, there were, um, there were three, if I'm not, I might be mistaken on that. And now there are four, but I can double check that. Um, the, um, in the last version that we had, from April 23rd, they were on page 19, the two Romanettes. Yeah, so, so I think it was setting the pension stabilization target number. Yes. Um, I, I might defer to Chris to explain that because that seems more 
numbers focused. <laughs> Chris, would you like to? Thank you, Madam Chair, for the record, Chris Rip, Joint Fiscal Office. Um, <coughs> Senator Collimore, that's a great question. The, the overall theme, I think, is consistent with respect to focusing on options and recommendations that could um, focus on sort of chipping away at the year-over-year -year increases we saw um, from FY21 to FY22. I think the, the distinction with this language is it specifies it and sort of clarifies that that the task force is not charged with sort of an all or nothing approach, that, that they should prepare um, a, a set of options and recommendations to say to the legislature, here's what it would look like or here's what it would take to, to chip away at 25% of that size of the growth, 50%, 75% or the full thing. And just uh, translated um, those percentages into rounded off dollar figures um, to, to try to make it a little bit clearer with a little less actuarial jargon, um, what it is this language translates to into dollars. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Can we, okay, but can we, everyone can stay there for a second. I'm just trying to read A, so it says, sorry, my dog also doesn't like the rain or something. Um, act, so uh, lower the actuarially determined employer contributions based on actuarial va value of assets by 25, 50, 75% and 100% of the size of the increases. It's a lot of language. So if I understand correctly, what it's saying is show us scenarios for either a zero increase, a 25% increase of 50% or a, or a 100% increase. I don't understand. There's, there's no, there's nothing for the zero increase, but okay. For the, for the yes. Zero. So the, the, the other part is correct. So for 25, 50, 75, and a hundred percent, and then the Romanets um, provide the detail on what those actual numbers are rather than just giving the percentage um, for, for both systems. It's saying for ADAC, you know, 25% was 16 million. Um, okay. But your system. Okay, so it says, I just wanna to try to read one of them. Lower the determined employer contribution by 100% of the size of the increase. That means a zero increase, doesn't it? No. Lower it by 100% of the increase? What no, does that mean? Zero increase would be status quo situation. But what does it mean to lower it by 100% of the increase? You're lowering the size of the in, lowering it by 100% of the size of the increase. So the increase in in uh, the teacher retirement system was to the ADAC was 64.1 million dollars. That mm -hmm. would be 100% of the increase. So if you're preparing an option that would get at 25% of the size, what of about 100%? Lower it by 100%. Then that would be 64.1 million dollars. That's what I'm saying, right? So you lower it by that. Right? You would lower it by the. 64 million. But it, but I think in, to your point is that I think by the time this would be lowered, it is going to have increased more. So you're not yeah. going to be back to where you were. Even if you lower it by 64.1 million, <clears throat> you're not going to be at the number from fiscal year 21, if that helps. Kind of. It, it seems exceptionally convoluted to me. Like, I think we want to help people understand what we're doing. And I don't know where it's at odds with just speaking plain English to do that rather than what's happening here. This is very strange. I, I think the attempt was putting the numbers in which was trying to make clear exactly what what amounts you were they, they were the task force is going to recommend lowering it by. Um, but the intro to this is explaining the framework for it. So we're like, that those numbers represent 25, 50, 75, and 100%, that they're not just arbitrary numbers being in the, put in the bill. Madam, um, I think, oh, Tom, Tom I'm had, sorry. Tom I think, hand up. Yes, I saw that, thank you. Oh, Thanks sorry. Here. Um, to me, it looks like, and this is what I understood that we were trying to accomplish is to link it to the current amortization schedule. So we already have a plan to fully fund the unfunded liability if all of our current estimates uh, hold true to 2038. 
this was a way it's it by th throwing out the numbers is basically telling the committee well this is what we currently have in terms of the asset uh, the amortization schedule listed both for teachers and for employees and so it was trying to get in a way to link to the current existing so they don't come back and say okay the easiest way to do this is to just uh, uh re-amortize or the, the easiest way to do this is is uh they'll have to look at multiple options and they'll have to look at multiple issues going on with each year's amortization in order to come up with it there are a lot of numbers here it, it, it's there is already a plan in place. The question is, is that reasonable? And how else would you do it to reach these objectives? I guess that's probably the easiest way to, to put it. Madam Chair, are you taking comments at this point or questions? Um, both, I guess, if, if the, does, does it, do any committee members have any more questions or clarifications or does it make sense? Okay, I guess that... like there has to be a simpler way to say this. And if there's not, then I just I'm, I feel like I feel like I'm being asked to to do something I don't understand, and I wouldn't want other people to feel like they don't understand. There has to be a simpler way to say this. I I, I just well, this is the attempt I think to say it in a simpler way. I mean, if you compare it to what was before, this is actually I think illustrates the the money that we're talking about. So <clears throat> the way I, what money we're talking about. the way I understand this is that the task force would be looking at options to lower the <clears throat> a deck it's called by twenty five percent and the unfunded liability by twenty five lower the increase lower the delta that's different right lower the increase by twenty five percent not lower it by twenty five percent lower. No, it's, it's, it's setting up scenarios of how do you lower it by these different percentage numbers? Like what would, it, how, how would you achieve lowering it by 16 million? How would you achieve lowering it by 32.1 million, right. et cetera? But over so, what? Lowering it over what? The change from the previous year? That, th that amount represents that change. That is the change. Right, but that's different than saying you would lower it by the amount of saying you would lower it by the percentage of the increase of the previous year, not just lower it. Um, Chris or Tom, can you help us out here? Yeah, Madam Chair, I think I think what they're saying is the, these are these are the sizes of the increases. So, so like you you would be you know the size of the increase. I'm I'm just looking at. Uh, line five there just for, for simplicity on the teacher system where it says 64.1 million that would be a hundred percent of the size of the increase so this is beth if i could try to um get to a point that rebecca made as well so right now this is the the valuation at 6 30 2020 and the change was 604 million and 96 million uh, on the teacher side, it's roughly uh, 370 not excuse me, 379 million and 64.1. So 64.1 for the ADEC, 379 uh, million uh, for the um, uh, for the change between the 2019 Val, which impacted the 2021 budget, and the 2020 Val uh, that impacted the uh, 2000. It will impact the 2022, although you fully appropriated the money in the current budget. Uh, so that's the intent of this language. I think getting to Rebecca's point, if the committee's working to December and a new VAL comes out, you, you will have a moving target. So you need to define the period of time because you could have a gain or a loss. Um, and, and we don't know what that's gonna look like. Right now, our investments are doing very, very well. Um, we still have April, May, uh, excuse me, May and June to go. Um, but uh, you know, we've um, uh, th this would set the time frame um, uh, of you know, set it from the 604 million and the 96. I think it would be helpful. And again, I'm going to have to go back up. This is the first time I've uh, I've had a chance to look at it. What I think you would want to do in here is say that the uh, the current between 2021 
uh, the valuation that affects 2021 and the val valuation that affects 2022, the ADEC um, and the um, and the unfunded liability, if you want to split them up, are you know 379 million uh, for the um, uh, for the uh, teachers and um, and 225 million because that's the target on which the percentages are based. Now I'm going to be very candid. I'm not uh, uh, when you get to the comment period. I'm still answering a question. I have some concerns about those percentages, but I would define the base as you know 379 and and 64. And 225, and I could do the math here quickly, but I won't. Uh, for the teacher system, it's right there um, at 100%. Define the difference that you're looking for. Getting to um, 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 uh, uh, Senator Rahm's question, define the base on which you are making percentage changes. And I think that right up front, you need to say that the difference between the two was 604 and 96 million and break it out. And then you're looking at 25% of that, 50%, 75 and 100. And again, I have a comment on that, but I think that's the answer to the question. Um, and I, I guess I'll defer to Senator Rahm if, she, if, if you think that works. I need, I need some time with this and I haven't felt more comfortable that I understand why, why we need to do this, why we need to, what the discomfort was with, I understand we need to be somewhere between more sustainable and specific. This feels exceptionally specific and just, you know, really hard to, to ask a group to do in a short period of time. These are, this is like reapportionment, but but like a lot more. I mean, they have to toggle to a lot of really specific ranges, it looks like. And that, I, maybe we could say a scenario over here and a scenario over there, and that gives us some sense of what's in between. But to say 25, 50, 75, 100, I think, I think then they need, you know, two years to do this and a lot more than $200,000 of financial support to do this. This is a huge task. Senator, if I could... Um... You know, I, I, I would agree with you on, on the percentages. And uh, again, um, uh, Madam Chair, if, if you want me to comment, I think it would be helpful because, um, sure. yeah, sure. So, you know, in a previous testimony, um, both uh, Chris and myself said, you need to have a goal in what we were talking about with the 604 and the 96, and you can disaggregate it. You need to have a goal um, because if you don't, then the committee's kind of in a position where they don't know where to settle. And if you do 25%, then you have to say, what's the amortization schedule look like and how far do you have to push it out? And then you have to do another one for the 50% and the 75%. I think that would be more helpful is if you said something to the effect of approaching the 604 million, again, dis disaggregate it, and the 96 million. Um, and what, you know, we came to 474 and we came to, um, um, uh, uh, 80 some odd million dollars, 85 million is coming to mind. I don't have the sheet in front of me of the, um, of, of the ADEC. Uh, we couldn't get any further than that. Um, now, you folks came out with a higher number based on a scenario that was very different. I think yours was north of 500, Chris. Um, but um, I guess the issue is, I would say approaching that number and then the committee can say, well, we couldn't get there or this is a reasonable level of benefits. And then, but to do an artificial 25, 50, 75 and 100, I think um, creates more cumbersome, it's more cumbersome and it creates more effort at each one of those scenarios. And I would argue that uh, if you just do 25, um, your amortization table is gonna go out um, and it's going to cost the taxpayer more money. And I think we need to say approach that. And uh, without putting words in, in Chris's mouth, we talked about having goals and trying to, and, and the goal that, you know, that uh, the board of trustees had was to lower the number um, to, to the previous levels. And again, I think that if you said approaching within reasonable levels of benefit changes or something along that line, give yourself a hedge, um, but make every effort to try to get to the best term possible within benefits, within revenues, and within uh, uh, to, to get to that. But uh, again, I think that this is very, very cumbersome, creates more work. And I don't think, to be very candid, 25% would get you there. 
Now, if you need to have some combination of revenue and benefits, this still leaves you the opening. And again, saying approaching within reasonable benefit uh, changes or, or something or with a combination of benefits and revenues um, or just leave approaching. This, this artificial construct will create more work and the utility of the pieces at the, at the lower end of the spectrum won't get you to, um, to where you need to be. Okay, I, um, I, I understood that the way, the reason, one of the reasons we put these in here is because it, it um, allowed for kind of um, steps. If we come up with um, a solution for the 25% in year one or two, and then 50% and so that it wasn't, you weren't saying right off hand, right off the bat that you have to do this all right now. It's all or nothing. That, that was my understanding that that was one of the, the reasons for looking at something like this so that you, you, might, you might have a different approach. You, you might have phased in approaches for the different, but if that doesn't make any sense, that's I mean, Madam Chair, have short-term short-term goals and and work your way towards the long-term, yeah, solution. Again, Madam Chair, there's an inconsistency in here. If you were to just do 25% of the unfunded liability, the fiscal year 23 ADEC would go up significantly more than the 96.6 million we're having because by statute you have to solve the problem by 2038. So if you do less change now, it's gonna cost you more in the future and it's also gonna cost interest. The other option is to push out the, uh, the amortization period um, and doing that will cost the taxpayer even more interest. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not a good solution. It would be um, badly received by the investment community. But if you have a 25% unfunded liability reduction, you still have more liability over time um, to um, that you have to solve in terms of repayment of the mortgage. So if you lower the amount of money you're paying up the front at the front end, and you haven't changed the mortgage, uh, you have to pay more at the other end, and uh, that becomes more expensive, as I said, for the taxpayer. Okay. Well, I guess that was um, an exercise in futility. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, I, I, I think what, just maybe to put a, a fine point on what, what the treasurer just said, and I think her, her point's a, an important one, is, you know, I, I think the, the language she's proposing, you know, that perhaps you move away from the 25, 50, 75 uh, scenario would, would in fact more closely resemble the prior language only without the dollar signs. So um, that would really, you know, if, if the committee, I, I think the committee has latitude and, and slicing and dicing this how they feel is appropriate, but um, I just wanted to clarify for, for anybody that's watching that, that would be that would be moving a little bit more to the prior version. It's just that the prior version didn't translate those percentages into dollars. So if that's where the committee wants to go, um, you know, the, the dollars would, would, would basically just be what's in here at, at the high end, um, and, and those would be, would be transposed over to the prior text. All right. Yeah, Keisha. So I, I didn't, I, that's not what I heard from the treasurer. I could be wrong. I heard her saying that even if you just did 25%, you would get a reasonable cost benefit analysis. And I think, I, I, don't, I don't think she said just take out the dollar figures, which are illustrative of the percentage amounts. Right. I think doing 25, 50, 75, 100, those are all four very different exercises that are each time consuming and involve a lot of different scenarios. And so picking one and, and noting the costs and benefits, because I think sustainable is a very subjective term, right? You know, to say sustainable, you could be sustainable from an employment and recruitment perspective or sustainable from a financial perspective. But to say, what are the costs and benefits of taking one of those percentages and demonstrating what the the amount, you know, decrease over the delta would look like and what the costs and benefits of the ideas to get there are. That's what I heard, but, but Madam Treasurer and yeah. others, correct me if I'm wrong. 
So I think that we're pretty much on the same page, Senator. I think the one correction I would make or difference is that uh, if you do only 25% of the unfunded liability, you're still facing those higher costs, not as high as the, mm -hmm. the current amortization, the 604 and the 96 million, which by the way, again, our calculations are by 2037, that would be a half billion dollars of ADEC. Um, and, you know, at, at the, at the, the, the risk of, you know, it, it, it would increase the amount of uh, impact it would have on your operating funds because the growth in terms of the budget, not so much the, the present value of the dollars, but in terms of, um, of its, its share. So going with a lower number increases the amount of ADEC you'd have to have, mm -hmm. Go, you know, and be simply because you have to pay the mortgage. Your point is well taken about doing these at different levels because it's extraordinarily complex. You would have to do this on what the impact is, is it 25% of the ADEC or is it 25% of the um, unfunded liability? So you'd have to do two. Then you have, so you'd be doing uh, one, two, three, four, eight different versions of this to get to that. Uh, and then you have the question of, do you do it to 2038 or do you do it further out to, uh, to kind of smooth out the amortization? So now you've got, um, uh, potentially as many as 16 different scenarios, um, you know, with this. I think that having language, and this is something that I think, uh, and again, Chris, I'm not trying to put, you know, words in, 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 in your mouth, but I think we both said that something saying that you approach it or something with a goal um, is very important uh, to get to, you know, and again, the definition of sustainable will differ from person to person, but approaching the, um, the, the reduction of the 604 and the 96, and I think approaching helps because it leaves you some room, and a combination of benefit and revenues so that you recognize uh, the, the impact that revenues might have in, in terms of this. Now, I, I believe that you need to make structural changes as well, and that you can't just rely on revenue, but I think that that kind of language gets you someplace uh, because, again, I'm looking at this and saying, the, you can't do 25% of the, of the, um, of the um, unfunded liability and then reduce the ADEC by um, 25%. It just, the, it just won't work. I Chris, just, I don't know if you feel differently about that. I see Becky has her hand up. Um, I'm sorry, but I, I was scheduled to four today and I could stay a couple okay. minutes more, but I didn't know if you wanted me to go over the other new language quickly before. Yeah, why don't you do that? And then we can continue this conversation. Chris and Tom, are you able to stay a bit? Okay, yep, right. I'm good. So the other, the other new language is in the next section. It's section 11. Um, and it's creating, uh, so this is on, looks like page 23. Uh, it's creating a joint legislative pension oversight committee. Um, so moving on to the next page, the, and this is a st in statute. Um, so this committee is created for the purposes of exercising oversight over the state employees and teachers system and working with and providing assistance to other legislative committees that work on state retirement systems. And uh, I, I put in OPEB as a, an open question there. Um, the membership of the committee would be appointed each biennium, and it would be three members of the House appointed by the Speaker, um, and they would not be from the same party, and then three members of the Senate um, not from the same party who'd be appointed by the Committee on Committees. Um, so the duties of the, the committee would be to evaluate and make recommendations on um, issues of public policy relating to the provision of retirement benefits to the state's public sector workforce. Um, they'd look at any changes to statutory provisions regarding the um, provision, design, and administration of both retirement benefits and retirement systems. And then finally, looking at the appropriate annual appropriation to fund the state's retirement obligations. Um, and that would be in accordance with actuarial recommendations, statutory amortization schedules, and funding policies. Um, the committee would be electing a chair, a vice chair, and a clerk from among its members and be able to adopt their own rules of procedure. And each uh, biennium, the chair would rotate between House and Senate members. Um, 
in terms of meetings, uh, they could meet at the call of the chair during session. And then I've left blank how many times during um, the off session that the committee would be able to meet. Um, but there's also ability to meet with the approval of the speaker and the president and the, the pro tem. Uh, a quorum of the committee would be four members. Um, the committee would have assistance from Ledge Council, Legislative Operations, and JFO. And then the members would also be eligible for uh, compensation and reimbursement um, when, the when the General Assembly is not in session. So are there any questions about for Becky about this section? Any kind of uh, I'm just having a hard time finding it. Um, my apologies. Is that in yellow? It's green. It's in green, and it's it's, it's past the task force. It's way. It's the very last it's thing. Near, it's oh. it's way near the end. It's on page twenty four. Okay. Yeah, we don't have pages on this, unfortunately. My apologies for interrupting. I'm hoping to get all colors of the rainbow by the time we're done. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to read it because <laughs> mine are all gray anyway. It doesn't make any difference. I just have to go to the end of the of the bill. So, are there any uh, technical questions questions for Becky about this before she has? To, yeah, Senator Colmore. I don't. I don't think it's a technical question for Becky. I just wondered how this interplays with VPIC. It, you've got a pension board sitting on top of them. I'm. I'm not sure how this works. So this, so VPIC is, is more, uh, is making the investment decisions for the retirement systems. This, this committee is more of a, a legislative oversight committee. So they're not, they're looking at um, when the legislature uh, is presented with policy decisions surrounding the retirement systems, they would consider those, they would consider any statutory changes. Um, they would look at, you know, making recommendations for how much should be appropriated to fund the okay. retirement systems. Um, so they don't have the sort of investment responsibilities or oversight of the investment that uh, of VPIC. It's, it's more just the l oversight over the legislative role with respect to the retirement systems. Thank you. I think, I think that we saw this as being um, just having a, a a retirement committee that kind of kept an eye on things as as it went along from year to year and they as with all oversight committees they don't really have any power they just make they have to make recommendations to the standing committees and i, I think it would be similar to the um joint legislative the justice oversight committee i never know yeah. the exact title but yeah. they, they they have a similar function with respect to um judicial matters um, under the, the jurisdiction of the legislature. And this, this really goes to, I think, the treasurer's point earlier, which is we really need to own this more respond, more fully. The legislature has to make the calls on this. We, we need to, uh, this is, goes to sort of ownership and oversight. And, and really, uh, if we have a group charged with it, I think they will attend to it more fully. Senator Rahm? I, I can, this is maybe, this is not to Becky, so I can wait if, if it's just questions for Becky right now. It looks like there aren't any right now. Okay. Um, I, I worry about the message that this sends because to me, it sends a message that we're gonna keep messing with people's pensions. And I'd much rather see us put language in to the task force or somewhere in this whole bill that says after this once someone signs a contract with the state at a certain pension level it does not change and what I worry about is having this oversight group that's constantly looks like it might be setting policy and messing with things just adds more anxiety to the lives of the employees whose, whose pensions are being overseen. And we just talked about having financial experts <laughs> make these decisions. So I just, I don't know what value a group of legislators would be adding to that. So that's just my feeling about this. Well, I think that one of the things that we talked about was that the legislature um, just kind of kept shoving things down the 
road for a long time. I mean, we didn't take that responsibility and that right. ownership. And that this, th this isn't looking at the benefits. This is looking at the, the kind of where are we? Are we falling behind? Are we keeping up with it where we're supposed to be? I, this committee, this oversight committee can't change any benefits. Okay, it says changes to statutory provisions regarding the provision design and administration of retirement benefits and retirement systems. But so, not the benefits themselves, the administration of the benefits. I, I, I mean, we can change that language, but I think that, I think that we personally, I think we really need some kind of an oversight committee that from the legislature that can, can be responsible for making sure that we're um, moving in the right direction. This is one of our biggest obligations as, as a legislature, one of our biggest responsibilities. And we have no legislative oversight. We have legislative oversight, joint oversight committees on a lot of other things that have less financial impact on the state than this. I don't know why we said someone couldn't be a legislator and serve on VPIC, but now we have six legislators over here that we're adding to a new layer of oversight. I don't really understand the point. Well, VPIC is a, an investment committee. This I don't- is, This is not an investment committee. This is a, making recommendations to the standing committees in the legislature work, you know, probably- about, from, I, I, I guess you've said what it's not about, but I don't know what it would be about then because this says all about the design of the benefit administration. If it's helpful, I mean, there are, you know, this is the, the benefit issue is, is what the legislature is dealing with right now. But there, I mean, there are pension related bills that come up every session. So, I mean, there are other, a number of other statutory changes that do happen each year. Um, so that could be an example of something else that they would consider. Um, I know that the treasurer can can probably speak to this more, but there's been sort of studies that the treasurer has been tasked to do over the last number of years with respect to certain uh, membership groups. Um, there's there have been a lot of miscellaneous sort of amendments to the retirement system statutory language. So I think there this is more just looking at. Um, so, so the reference to statutory provisions would, would also include, I think, some of those examples of other kinds of changes that the legislature considers each year. So I feel like that's what this committee's for, but I'm new. And then in addition to that, I think the only thing that would give me any comfort enough to support that is that at some point in the bill, we're saying, once we make changes next time, we're not, we're, that is, we are looking at ways to make that binding and to not continue to change people's pensions after they sign a contract with the state. I, um, I would love to be able to say that, but I don't think I could ever commit to that. Changes are made all the time to everything. And um, I mean, I thought I signed a contract with for my social security and they're changing my benefits all the time for Medicare. And they're all, I, my social security check keeps going down because they keep giving me a 2% increase and then increasing my Medicare payments by 6%. So, so I, 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 I think that if we, if we put that in here that nothing would ever change, then, okay. then what we're doing is saying that any, any increased liabilities always fall on this, on the legislature, on the state budget. I mean, just to be fair, you may feel that way about your social security, but the federal government, when they take on new employees, sign a contract that does not change their retirement benefits. It so never, it never changes. That's I can't believe that they're changing that, 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 that those benefits don't change. We can double check, but a lot of constituents emailed and said, you know, I wish you were like the federal government. When my spouse signed a contract with the federal government, that is a binding contract. They do not change. You cannot change their benefits after you cannot change the retirement benefits after that. Is that, does anybody know if that's true? I, I'm surprised, but I guess if it's. Oh, we I can. I, I mean, I, without any detail, and, and sorry, I do have to go in a minute, but yeah. <laughs> without any detail or, or context for that question, I think that this goes back to a question of whether 
Um, there, you know, I think it's a constitutional question of whether there is a, a violation of a con of the contracts clause. Um, and so the under the, the US Constitution. And so I think that there's a little more to the analysis than just um, it's never possible to change. But again, I can't speak to anyone's specific search situations or contracts. But um, it, I think there are scenarios where um, benefits do change based on what is being changed and the specific uh, contract in place. Madam Chair, before uh, no. Rebecca leaves, may I ask a question about that? Sure. sure. My understanding, and again, um, uh, recognizing that I'm um, uh, a person in the finance world and not legal, um, but what I'm seeing is uh, that uh, that uh, while there's a contract clause in the federal government, uh, there's also an a, a understanding, and I, I hate the word that they use, but the uh, that in no way does that change the state's policing, uh, which means oversight of um, uh, of, um, of of benefits, uh, whether or whether it's um, other state uh, services, and essentially that um, it doesn't take away the power of the states under certain circumstances. And I and I believe I've seen different opinions on this particular issue, uh, but uh, that that essentially um, you can't abrogate the state's uh, the um, ability to um, to to make its own decisions around this within certain parameters in terms of you know whether there's a financial need to do it, um, an equity issue and the like. So I'm going to defer to 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 Becky. I've seen some decisions on that, and I and I uh, again um, I don't have a law degree. I'm not going to pretend that I end, uh, know that, um, but I, I'm looking for some help in understanding that. Yeah, so I think, you know, it's, it's, this is something that's hard to generalize because <laughs> it's really specific to what, what the source of the legal contract is and what, what is actually being changed. But in general, I guess, um, what the treasurer was just speaking to is that um, sort of a, one prong of the, the test for under the contracts clauses whether there is, uh, you know, sort of a reasonable and necessary reason reason for this change, and that is, you know, it, some examples of that are, are like if the state is under such severe fiscal distress, and there have been examples where the courts have found that, you know, the fiscal situation is is so bad in a state that it has warranted, and even if even if you are impairing someone's contract, it has warranted um, being able to do that. Um, but again, it's it's really hard to generalize because I think it's a it's very fact specific analysis. So I would like to. Um, I think there are two questions here. One is the question first about the um, oversight committee, and I I hear Senator Rahm that you do not think we need an oversight committee that just. Um, the, the goal was that somebody in the legislature is always um, kind of being cognizant of what is happening with our retirement systems. And we could say that's this committee, but this committee has a bazillion things that we're responsible for. And we can't be the oversight committee for elections and for, and judiciary committee is not the oversight committee for the judici judicial um, oversight. It, it's a separate committee that is made up of both House and Senate members. And so I hear you saying we don't need this. Um, I would like to hear from Senator Polina and Senator Collimore about this oversight committee. Senator Collimore? I would support it. I think if we had it 10 years ago, we'd be in a different situation today. I, I think that we need someone who keeps a closer eye on what's going on with the pension situation. I mean, how we ever fell this far behind without legislators being fully informed. I don't know whether that's a fair way to put it, but not reacting enough anyway. So I think that there needs to be some oversight that's clearly from the legislature. I mean, we're stuck holding the bag, so to speak, in terms of making the appropriations. 
Senator Clarkson? Yeah, I, I think it really goes to Beth's comment, which I had appreciated, which is, you know, we need to own own this issue more fully and give it more weight than we do. And having a legislative oversight committee does exactly that. I mean, it puts uh, it it puts a constant uh, uh, eye on one of our greatest responsibilities, and we should pay more attention to it. So I see Steve has his hand up, and then Tom. I'll put my hand up too. Okay. And, oh yeah, Tom has his too. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just uh, having reviewed this just now, I, I, I have some concerns about it. Um, and and the, I hear uh, what members of the committee are saying about the legislature's role and responsibility. My concern is that the full legislature has that responsibility. And what I'm worried about, because this is a politically volatile issue, as you can see, and it's something that people care deeply about, is that the legislature will uh, frequently, with oversight committees, defer those decisions to, the, to a much smaller group of legislators who serve on the oversight committee in the off session. Um, and it makes it harder for um, Vermonters to um, effectively advocate and essentially influence their legislature um, if it's a small group of legislators who are uh, currently, they may not have the power to make changes, but as things progress, we know that in past legislative initiatives, the legislature has given oversight committees the power to make decisions. Um, I, I, so I, I do agree that the legislature does have to provide oversight. Um, and you know, certainly I, if anyone's had an opportunity, um, Treasurer Pierce is not only a fiscal wizard, but she is an artist. And she has also created a collage of reports that she provided to the legislature, <laughs> several committees of, the, of what was happening with the pensions. Um, and, and, and so I just am concerned that actually the oversight committee may have the opposite effect of having the full legislature provide its oversight role. And instead, um, it might be too tempting to um, just empower a small number of legislators um, who could make big decisions without um, the ability of Vermonters to be able to effectively advocate one way or the other. So before we jump to Tom, I'm gonna to ask you a question, Steve. In my experience, no oversight committee has been able to make decisions. They can make recommendations to standing committees. Right. But I, I've never seen an oversight committee that can actually make a decision. Right. Well, I, so I can give you an example. <laughs> okay. like. So uh, the, the Joint Justice Oversight Committee yep. and the Joint Child, Pro Child Protection Committee um, made a decision to uh, privatize Woodside. And it was not a decision that was made by the full legislature. It was made by a small group of legislators. Um, so it, unless those legislators are your <laughs> legislator, uh, it was very difficult for our members, for inst instance, to have any influence on that decision because their legislators weren't on the oversight committee. Um, so that, that does happen. It, it just happened in this last summer. Um, and so I, I just raise it as a concern because I do agree with you. I think the discussion about the legislature um, having oversight, um, we would want, our view would be that more legislators, the entire legislature is elected to have oversight uh, but we, we think it might be too tempting to give a small group of people the power uh, to make difficult political decisions. Um, and I, I think that is just a caution that we would have about having this kind of an oversight committee. Well, I do have a little bit of a disagreement about how Woodside, how yeah. that happened. I, it wasn't as clear as that, but in my opinion, because I sit on judiciary and we wrestled with that a lot. So I don't think it really was that a decision that was made that easily. And we could set up a joint oversight committee of 180 people. Um, I don't think that's very effective. And, and, and I don't think that 180 people will pay equal attention to it. I think when you're 
uh, nominated by your peers to serve on a specific committee that, you know, that your antenna are up for that. Your antenna is on every bill that recommends different retirement changes to the tax code. Your antenna are up for anything that would change or uh, affect uh, the retirement system in, in any capacity. And there are bunches of different ways it could do that. So I, I think it, it's, it, it, you know, I, I, dis I disagree with you, Steve. I think actually it would help with ownership. And I wish we'd had this 15 years ago. I mean, I, I, wish, I, I, I wish we'd had a group of people who really were dedicated to paying more attention. And you're right. Beth gives us a report every year. And it's one of many reports. And if you had six people paying really much closer attention to it and understanding the implications of some of those recommendations, I, I, I would think we would be in a different place. So, because really- I just, I, just, have... I, I just want to be clear that I did not see this oversight committee making big decisions either. No, just recommend- I just saw them as somebody who's as sort of tracking what's going on and reporting yeah. back. But that's what I mean. Did I say something different than that? I didn't mean no, to. I... I th no, well, Steve had talked about not wanting right. to make big decisions. No, they make recommendations to the- Because they're paying attention. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think oversight is, is definitely needed. Um, my one question and concern, this sounds almost like more of a subcommittee of this committee. I don't know if the legislature has subcommittees. Um, no. In the corporate world, you would see this as a subcommittee because it really is addressing an issue for this committee's functioning, as I believe. One concern I would have is, well, who would VPIC report to? I know all of the this legislation has us reporting to GovOps with all our reports anticipated for the VPIC changes. So I would just recommend some consideration given to the changes that you're anticipating with VPIC. There are a lot of reports and recommendations and oversight built into that. Um, would this be an addition to and another step before the legislature or would it be an addition to or complementary to and how would the, who would have the final word? What if GovOps says something different and this committee has some other different opinion. It just makes it a little confusing. This committee has no authority to do anything. Okay. The only thing they have authority to do is to um, make recommendations. And really, you, my guess is that the, um, com the committee will, the oversight committee will probably most likely be made up of people from GovOps and appropriations because those are the two committees, just as justice oversight is made up of people from judiciary and probably uh, corrections and institutions in the house. So it, it's the committees that, that are the most involved in it, but it means that that is their main, their main focus instead of the uh, 27 bills that we've been dealing with this year and the reports that came from all of them. This committee would be focusing on just retirement and pension. It's a big issue and I, I think it needs it needs the attention. Um, Jeff has I think Becky, yes. you're, mu you, you're muted. Sorry, um, typically if there's, led, if there's something that needs to go to an oversight committee, it's just drafted in that particular le legislation to send it to that oversight com committee. It's not um, sort of set in statute that everything goes to them. It's just a, uh, if there's a particular issue that the legislature wants that committee to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Beth? So I apologize that um, I can't raise the hand because I can't figure out how to do that on my I agenda. can't either. I can't either. So just then I'm, in company. then I'm in good company. So first, I would like to say thank you, Steve, for referring to my work as an artist. Um, and uh, uh, I did present in one of the packages to you a copy of some of the reports because I ran out of room um, uh, that we submitted uh, with the status of the plans and uh, and and uh, some of the concerns that we had, but uh, again, uh, that uh, uh, art was never a, a way that people describe me. Although I appreciate art, um, but uh, let me start with what the division of of, um, of responsibilities are currently. So you really have four. Uh, one is the uh, retirement board of trustees, and they are charged uh, by by uh, frankly 
uh, they're not charged by ERISA, which is uh, private plans, but they are charged uh, by the IRS. And, uh, and some of the, uh, the, the, re the requirements are that they act solely in the interest of the participants and their beneficiaries. And they act for the exclusive purpose of providing those benefits to workers uh, and, uh, 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 and making sure that the expenses are, are reasonable for the plan and carrying out duties with care, due diligence. And, and the remaining pieces relate to diversifying assets and the like. So they have a very definite fiduciary responsibility in the if and they take a look, we take a look on a regular basis, uh, part of the miscellaneous tax bill, I, um, I would uh, point out, uh, Becky, but um, to make sure that uh, we're in compliance with the IRS and uh, we go through a process of reviewing that the IRS used to do determination letters so uh, if you did a determination letter on your statute uh, uh, you were in good shape uh, um, and anything that was done after that uh, would be something that would uh, be okay uh, something they would look at but anything that was in that determination they've stopped doing that but essentially you're responsible for that so that's a board function the other function um, is that the retirement staff, and they work for the boards uh, through the treasurer's office, so they report to, to our office, but essentially what they're doing is administering the benefits, and there's been legal rulings by the attorney general's office that a board that meets monthly or uh, infrequently is not in a position to, to do those administ that administration, whether you put it under a board or, or, or whatever, but we are essentially tasked with making sure that uh, the benefits are done. Those 500 retirements that we did in the month of June last year remotely, I want to again thank the, the retirement staff, talking to people um, about their benefits, talking to, to people about their options in retirement. As you might imagine, that's a life-changing uh, event, and we spend a lot of time on talking about their health care. So that's number two. The third one is the investments, which you've addressed in the, um, in the, um, the, the earlier section on the structure of VPIC. And uh, I'm very pleased that most of that um, um, uh, is, is similar to what uh, Tom, Tom Galanka and I submitted. And on top of that, uh, had the endorsement, at least in concept, um, by the, uh, the VPIC. So the fourth is you. Uh, in the in the legislature, and you have two um, two responsibilities under statute. Number one, to define what those benefits are. So you are the creator, and again, the owner of that. So if there's a change in benefits, we can't make it. In fact, the miscellaneous tax uh, miscellaneous tax, excuse me, the miscellaneous retirement bill uh, frequently has adjustments to uh, make sure that we're in compliance. But secondly, benefit changes. Um, or, or changes in contributions. For instance, in the municipal system, over the last several years, uh, there's been multiple increases. It's kind of a risk sharing model in, in, in itself, which is that uh, the employer and the employee sh uh, share of contributions go up incrementally. And you approve that. If, if not, they would go to a different statutory level uh, and, uh, and cause some concerns for, uh, for, for the employees. Uh, so that is one of your responsibilities. The other responsibility is to appropriate the dollars. So you're, you're around the benefits and you are, uh, your, your issues are also around appropriating the, the dollars. And if you can't make the appropriation, you have two options. Number one, you can dig it, you dig yourself into a bigger hole or, or change the benefits. Uh, and uh, if, the, if the result is that despite the fact that you've made the ADEC, which we have, with the exception of the teacher system all the way through 2014 with healthcare, not just 2007, but the impact of uh, not appropriating the, the additional monies for healthcare. Um, you, you make the benefit changes uh, to address that um, or to address inequities. Uh, this summer, for instance, um, or a long time, uh, Madam Chair, we took a look at the Group C, um, who's in and who's out, another decision that you folks make um, but we had an advisory committee to take a look at that. And uh, I don't think that's going to happen this session, uh, Madam Chair, but I think it's something we, we still need to address. So that's the division of labor. Um, if you were to create an oversight committee that looked at um, the administration of the plan uh, and uh, took a look at the responsibility of the boards, for instance, to set the actuarial assumptions, um, to, to, um, to administer the benefits. I think that you would get into an issue uh, where politics, uh, frankly, would, uh, would override 
um, the number one and the number two IRS responsibilities, acting solely in the in interest of the participating participants and their beneficiaries, and acting for the exclu uh, exclusive benefit and purpose of those um, benefits um, and to, the, to members and their, um, and their beneficiaries. Uh, that's referred to as the exclusive benefit rule. Um, a while back, um, and we were talking, uh, I had a conversation with this about with some folks recently, uh, uh, two states, and I went, uh, one state and one municipality, um, without mentioning their name. So one state to balance their budget um, actually rated the pension fund, and the IRS came in and said, uh-uh, put the money back and, and, and give you interest. And another state getting, I mean, in a uh, municipality getting to Becky's question, uh, the IRS ruled that if they didn't do something along that line, um, that uh, they would, in fact, put the, uh, the system into, into um, jeopardy, uh, what I would refer to as the, um, the death spiral in terms of um, uh, the pension uh, system. So uh, getting the legislature involved in, in doing the work of the pension boards, I think, is, um, is contrary to what the IRS has. So I would want to work on the, the language. I do believe, and, and, and frankly, we've been sending in reports since 2012. You're right. Uh, I remember one, um, one day we did an eight-hour uh, piece on, uh, on pensions and oversight and environmental, social, and governance and, uh, we, uh, and D.C. versus D.B. And uh, I think that uh, the, the representatives that were there were, were, were strongly supportive of a defined benefit plan. But I would agree with you that it hasn't had the attention. We primarily make those, rec uh, those reports. Uh, we do an annual report uh, that all members have access to. It's on your, on your web, uh, web page. Oh, I think I have to move or the lights are going to go out. There we go. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we send reports to primarily GovOps and appropriations. But I would also agree with you that you have a lot of work um, and that perhaps you want to have folks to take a look at that. Um, and, and discuss that. I wouldn't say make the decisions. I would be very clear about no. that. But in the process, uh, taking a good look at those issues, how the, how the benefit structure, how the unfunded liability, how the ADEC is looking, how it's trending, and to provide that information um, in addition to our reports, because we will continue to do that. I think that that's something that um, I would recommend. But I think the language here goes too far. And, and it puts them in a position, um, and again, I've just taken a quick look at this language, where you're now creating uh, a, another role for the, uh, for the General Assembly. And that division of labor between investments, the pension board, the um, uh, board of trustees, the retirement division, and the, um, and the legislature, I think, needs to, to stay. Because if you start making those benefit changes, you're now in, uh, putting politics uh, excuse me, not benefit changes, into what the pension boards are doing, whether it's changing the actuarial assumptions, uh, changing um, um, uh, their process in terms of um, how they interpret benefits and hear appeals by employees or the disability functions. You're now getting into uh, the issue of uh, exclusive benefit rule, benefit rule. And uh, I think that that would be a danger uh, to the plan. But looking at appropriations, looking at uh, the ADEC, um, having some discussion about that and bringing it to, I think, you folks, because you are the uh, Committee of Jurisdiction and the Appropriations Committee, because it impacts them, is something that uh, um, uh, would work. Uh, again, we've sent the reports, but I think that um, uh, uh, Senator Polina's comments, are, um, and all of you, is that uh, why we've sent the reports, it has not received the attention it should. And I think that this might be a way to do it, but limit the functions of that oversight committee, uh, getting to Steve's point. Um, uh, if there's uh, too many decisions, uh, a decision-making authority there, you could run into you know, three or four people making decisions, being political about it. Um, and um, for instance, a, 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 a scenario that I, I, I would consider a nightmare would be a recommendation to, um, uh, to go with a defined contribution versus a defined benefit plan. I think that it's all right to have the conversations with your committee um, uh, about uh, the cost because a DC plan is more expensive um, and provides less benefits. Um, uh, so I think that's a lose-lose proposition. I'm talking too long. I was apologize for going there, but I think that, it, that the wording on this, if you're going to go forward with it, and I think there's some value to it, um, needs to be very clear about the, uh, the um, uh, responsibilities and the division of those responsibilities. 
So if somebody can point out the exact language here that needs to be changed, because that is exactly what this oversight committee is designed to do. It is not designed to make any decisions at all. Oversight committees do not have authority to make decisions. And I do disagree with uh, Steve around the Woodside decision and how that came about. But that aside, oversight committees cannot make decisions. They make recommendations. And so I, I am confused about what the language is that needs to change to make sure that we're saying that. And one of the things that I was thinking about when Anthony, when Senator Polina said that if we'd had this 10 years ago, if we'd had this 10 years ago, we might have, we're making a shift now around um, having the employees of uh, the, it is, it's the, the employees will now be employees of VPEC as opposed to in the treasurer's office. We might've made that decision seven years ago because I know you've been working on that for a while, but that isn't something that um, <clears throat> we have the ability to pay that close attention to, but this oversight committee could because they'll be listening and talking and hearing from people. And so I guess, I guess if there's um, uh, language that needs to change to make it clear that they don't make decisions, um, but I'm not sure we need to put that in because oversight committees can never make decisions. That's, they're not allowed to. So, so no. Madam, Madam Chair. If I may. Oh. Yeah, please. I'm gonna go to Jeff. Yeah, please. Thank um, you. So thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I'm catching up like others here, just seeing the language for the first time. Uh, I, won't, I won't rehash some of the concerns already expressed. I'll just add two, uh, specifically the oversight committee, and then you've got uh, the VPIC changing, and then you've got uh, the task force doing some work. And I do worry about uh, the overlap of the three now groups. And, and one solution may be to delay the start of the oversight committee until after the task force has done its work, for example, um, right? And so that you, and then you've got multiple legislators and multiple committees. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna be the same. Should they be the same? Should they be different so that you get a, a wider perspective? Is that, is that advisable in and of itself? Um, and then I think as best Beth articulated, um, the concern is the overlap of workload, if you will. And I appreciate that the, the, the workload of looking at the pension is a big one for this committee. And, and I would say that you, the Senate and House Government Operations Committee are the oversight, but if you wanna sort of delegate that responsibility to a subgroup over the summer, and I think that's what this is, um, it sounds like in, during adjournment, because it mentions that in the language too. So I assume then, and I don't know this, would they then report in January or something to the House and Senate GovOps committees of their work over the summer, and then you would carry it forward to the next adjournment and so on and so on? Yep. Yeah, I think I think that's that's the way they work, and that's the way oversight committees op tend to operate. And I think that during the session, um, they only meet if there's something really uh, dramatic that happens. Um, but they mainly meet over the summer and when we're not in session and we, we can't meet. So uh, we can't have any oversight in the summer. And I think that delaying the, um, the um, formation of the, I don't think there's any problem with that. I don't think we had any thought that, that this committee, when we were talking about it, that this committee would have um, uh would start to operate until the task force was was done with its work. That, but so I I appreciate that. Um, I will point out that um, under number two B two on members, mm -hmm. I I do think we need to change that a little bit because it says three members of the Senate who shall not be from the sane sane party, and I um, think there is no such thing. In the Senate, we all tend to be a little insane. So I just would make sure we correct that. 
Sorry, I was just trying to lighten that up a little bit. So, Madam, Chris? I'm sorry. Um, oh. I appreciate the light, uh, light, lighting. Uh, 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 never mind the uh, uh, reducing the um, the t tension and maybe a little sense of humor there. But um, you asked for some suggestions with respect to the duties and. Um, uh, if the if the commit once the committee has finished its work, I'd like an opportunity to suggest a few things. Okay. Well, no, this is the time to suggest them, but I'm going to call on Chris first. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just real briefly, I, I think the treasurer raised some really significant points and, and some important points. I just wanted to clarify one thing in the bill, just for anybody who may be watching at home, that the uh, the way this is currently worded, um, the oversight committee would evaluate and make recommendations on changes to statutory provisions. So it's not worded that the oversight committee would try to assume any fiduciary responsibilities or, you know, I, I think I think you raised the, the, the example of, of benefit appeals or, or things of that nature, just sort of the nuts and bolts of the day to day. I think the way this is worded is they, they would focus on making recommendations around things that involve changes to statute. Yes. I don't, I, I agree with what you just said. I think it would need wording changes to align with what you just said. I'm happy to expound on that more, but the line that I read earlier feels very out of sync with what you just said. So I, I would be, I, I can reopen it. I'm sorry, I closed I'm it. looking at line 17 on page 25. Is that the one I read before? I think what I had read before was on page 24, but I could be wrong. It said, ben it said something about benefit design, et cetera, et cetera. Statutory provisions around those. It isn't. Can someone read it out loud? Because I don't have it. Changes sure. to statutory provisions regarding the provision design and administration of retirement benefits and the retirement system. So it's only statutory changes that are being recommended. If there are changes that don't require statute changes, then this committee doesn't address them. They're an oversight committee for the legislature. And that I think this is standard language. Um, I think Becky pulled this out from oversight committees, the way they're, they're um, designed, but. I definitely agree with Jeff. It should take effect. I, I was looking at the effective date as well earlier. It should be changed to take effect after the work of the other group. I am not surprised to be outnumbered on the idea that more legislators on more committees, you know, does anything for anybody. I'm on the Government Accountability Committee and the Judicial Administration Committee. We've met once this year and have not really accomplished anything. So, you know, I, I have a lot of doubts about adding more bureaucracy and more committees to our structure. I, I have not seen it make a difference in Vermonters lives, but I'm completely willing to be outnumbered on this. It will not affect my vote on the overall bill. I mean, I think we can make this, this um, effective as of July, 2022. Then that means that because it would be appointed then during the, um, uh, the report from the task force comes back before January, we act on it in that in next year's session. And then the task, the oversight committee takes is appointed during that session and, and starts its meetings during the summer of 2022. With recommendations for 2023. Yeah, and it may not have any recommendations for 2023 because we've just made a whole bunch of changes. So it might not have any, it might come back and say, you know what, the changes that we made last year seem to be working okay, or we made this change and it really was a huge mistake and we need to go back and look at it. So it could, Senator Colomar. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be very brief because it's getting late. I know. Uh, Beth, when I made my statement, I certainly didn't mean to imply anything um, that was disrespectful to your work. But in fact, I think it, it, it points to the fact that this uh, committee would alleviate a lot of us from, from having to, I'm, I'm trying to say this the right way, they would meet in the summer, 
And we can't, especially in the Senate, when we're on two committees during the session, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff gets biased. I, I will be the first to admit, I don't read a lot of reports that was probably supposed to read, but that to me is even more of a reason why we could create this oversight committee whose only job it is to look at the reports that you have dutifully sent to us. Um, they can't make any recommendation what, or they can't make any decisions. I look at it the same as if we had a situation in a prison where there was a weekly breakout and the Justice Oversight Committee would, would get together and say, what's going on? What, 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 what could we possibly recommend that would, that would help this situation? Whether we need to buy a, you know, a, a more secure uh, system in terms of security or whatever. So I, I just, um, I still think if we, and I'm all for putting it off until the task force has completed its work, but I think I, I made a little bit of a case for putting the oversight committee because we're just so overburdened during the session that um, I think this would alleviate a lot of that pressure. Uh, Madam Chair, am, am I on board now, or, or do, are yep, there if you have if you have language changes, let's sure. get to them. Sure. So, um, and I, I would like to go back tomorrow to the scope of the task force, but uh, uh, right oh, now, we're going to do everything tomorrow. Okay, that's great. Um, so when I'm looking at this language, we're here uh, all weekend. What? We're here all weekend, Beth. You didn't. God, bring your pajamas. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm usually around, so you know. You're in charge of the cannolis and the popcorn. I gotta go get your cannolis. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm just. But um, I guess I could eat some remotely and um, and and, uh, and and really um, uh, not be satisfactory. So um, if I'm looking at this language, um, number two, which has been mentioned, changes to the statutory provisions regarding uh, the, the design and administration of retirement benefits in the retirement system. I would remove in the administration of retirement benefits in the retirement systems. That is the uh, purview of the board. And while I agree that you would not make uh, that the, you're making recommendations, not decisions. I think the implication there is that that's uh, that's in the purview of the um, of the of the um, uh, the the general assembly. Uh, so I would I would recommend taking that out. You know, uh, regarding the the provision and design design of benefits is within the purview of the legislature. As I said, you are the owner and the creator of that. Um, but I would take out that part of the administration and benefits that uh, if I'm if I'm on the I am on the board of trustees, uh, other members might, uh, as I do, see that that um, uh, may be ambiguous and create some problems in the future. Um, with respect to number three, the appropriate annual appropriation, what I would say there is that you would receive the ADEC, the actuarially determined employer contribution from the retirement board. Right now, we send it to the General Assembly and to the governor by November 1st uh, for the purposes of including it in the budget um, and, and a decision whether or not to do that. So I would say there that uh, uh, that committee would receive the actually determined employer contribution as recommended by the uh, respective board of trustees uh, and review that. Um, hopefully, I won't, uh, this wouldn't be in statute. Hopefully, say uh, we could do better than that. Um, but uh, uh, I, I would ask them to take a look at it and make any recommendations around it. So, again, if it, it would relate to number uh, one and two, which is that if it's, um, if it's something that you feel is something that can't be supported, then you would have those other conversations. Uh, but I would also um, be careful about uh, the, uh, the, the piece about. Um, uh, statutory amortization schedules, that is in your purview to change that um, and, and funding policies. Um, but I would, I would start off with that as the ADEC and receipt of that and the analysis of that, because again, we have conversations um, uh, that's in our reports to you. Um, we do have conversations with you and the appropriations about it, but a, a more focused, I think, makes sense. And we certainly have those conversations with the governor's office too, which is you know, I remember conversations going back to, what do you mean it increased this much? Um, usually that's the, that's the comment. When it goes down or less than, less than expected, everyone's uh, happy with that. Um, and number one, I don't know issues of public policy related to the provision of retirement benefits. 
uh, uh, to the state's um, uh, public sector workforce. I'm not quite understanding what public policy means in there, but that that again, that's um, uh, that's something that uh, you know could be wordsmith. But I would worry about two and three and make those changes. Um, uh, because I think then it, it, it respects the division of uh, responsibility and it's more clear about uh, your actions with respect to the ADEC. Because frankly, in 1990s and 2000s, if, um, if the committees of jurisdiction um, and, um, uh, and the administration, the governor's office, and that involved, I just have to say, multiple governors. We're not uh, picking on any one governor. Uh, that um, if, if more attention had been paid for that, uh, paid attention to that, we would not be in, in such a, a, um, um, a low funding percentage on the teacher side in particular. But I do have to point out something that is inaccurate and has been said many times, the $604 million increase or the $379 million increase in the teacher system is not related to the underfunding of the past. It's related to the changes in the, in the investment rate of return uh, assumption, and that's not investment performance because that's another problem where people link performance to the rate of return assumption because across the country, rate of return assumptions are changing and going down. But secondly, um, when, when you're looking at this, um, it, uh, the real action, the real, besides that rate of return in the teacher system, um, uh, uh, 50-50, the demographics were also moving the, 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 um, the, the curve on that. Um, and the demographics accounted primarily teacher turnover and teacher uh, retirements had, it, had a major impact. And if I'm looking at this uh, from a, a, um, uh, an oversight committee, I'd want to know why. And I think that that's a very important. You know, we talk about other decisions in there, but the reality is the biggest mover in the teacher system was that, and I think it has some relationship, frankly, to property tax. I'm not putting opinion out on property tax. I'm we're neutral on that in the treasurer's office. That's not our role in taxation. But as I said in many, many occasions, um, is that when you press the, the the balloon on one end, it pops out on the other, and the committee may want to take a look at the full impact of that. So, you know, what is the cost at the local level? What is the cost at the state level? And are you effectively making change um, from, a, from, uh, from the sum of the parts? Uh, so that would be uh, the changes I would suggest in two and three, and perhaps adding a little bit of, you know, it's interaction and policy with relationship to, um, to, to tax policy, perhaps. I think if I can comment, my, I think that number one, addresses that, the public policy, um, mm -hmm. that, that that is what that is intended to do, to look at the whole public policy as it's affected by that. And in, t in two, I, if we take out that administration of, and just say changes to statutory provisions regarding the provision design yeah, of the, benefits. The design, design of benefits. Of uh, benefits, yeah. okay. But on uh, number three, <clears throat> I was a little confused because you talked about they need to make the recommendation, but they need to receive it from the board first. And, and um, we, we can put that in there. It's, this committee certainly is not gonna be just meeting with themselves. They're not going to um, be operating in a vacuum and just get the six people get together and say, well, let's make a recommendation on the appropriate annual appropriation they're going to be meeting with with the appropriate people to get the information before they make the recommendation. So yeah. we can put it in there or not that first they have to receive the the information and then they make a recommendation. Yeah. I but, think the appropriate annual appropriation um, is is a is a little uh, vague. I think that what you would want to say is that you would receive the ADEC, the actual uh, recommendation from the Board of Trustees and make recommendations um, to the full body around the issues of um, appropriation, uh, amortization, and um, because that is in your, your purview. And um, uh, what's the last word in that one? Um, and funding policies. Uh, I think that that's appropriate. I would clearly disagree if you were to turn around and say, don't fund the whole ADEC. Um, as a, as a 
legislative body, certainly not the oversight committee. Um, I would certainly disagree if you said that's extend the amortization period to make this uh, easier to do right now because that's a short-term solution with a long-term loss to the taxpayer. That said, it is within your purview. But, but this isn't saying what they're going to recommend at all. This is just saying that they need to, they need to take the information, they need to gather all the information, and then they need to come and not to the whole, they're not going to make it to the whole General Assembly. They're going to make it to the committees of um, jurisdiction. They're going to make it to the House um, GovOps, Senate GovOps, and the two appropriations committees. They're not going to do it to the whole General Assembly. That isn't the way oversight committees work. Sure. So they're going to make those recommendations. So if we want to put in there that first they have to receive the information, um, we can we can do that. But I would be highly suspect of any oversight committee that didn't actually receive the information that they were looking at before they made a recommendation. But they wouldn't be doing very good oversight. Yeah. No, they would be terrible. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the you know the a a actuary does the ADEC, uh, the board, yes. do it. and I guess I just would start with that instead of the word appropriation because it 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 almost implies, um, not to you folks, but sometime in the future that um, that uh, the appropriation could be done in the absence of uh, the actuarial work. No, it says in accordance with actuarial recommendations. There you go. My apologies. Thank you. It clearly says that. My apologies. There again. This is a quick read. Um, so I think that that one may be a tad of wordsmithing and, uh, and again, number two, and I, again, my apologies, I'm, I'm looking at this for the first time with the wrong glasses, so. As we all are, actually. Yeah. Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, I just want to make clear my understanding of the reading where it said of a different party was that each of the three members would have to be of a different party than the other. No. No. It think. says not all shall be from the same party. So you could have two R's and one D or two D's and one R or one D and one P and one R, but you couldn't have three R's, three D's or three P's. That's the way. <laughs> huh? that, that changes things for me a little bit. I think we would benefit from having the maximum amount of political diversity in this group. We can do that, but we don't have any P's in the Senate. We have people who run as both. We do, but we don't have any P's. The P's do not caucus in the Senate as, well, a, as a caucus. We could maybe say, unless there are, you no. know, I, I, we could ask the working Vermonters caucus to appoint one from each side. No. I, well, okay, I shouldn't have been so. Okay. I think that, I think that oversight committees, legislative, yeah. com legislative committees are appointed by the speaker and the committee on committees. And if we start having caucuses that aren't even real, I mean, they're, they're, they are real, but they have no authority and no, um, they have no authority. To, they are. They make recommendations and they meet and um, look at issues. But why would we have them making a recommendation? Okay, well, your, your first no was to people of three different political parties. But you, we, you, you could have an independent. I, I just think we would benefit from from asking for the maximum amount of political diversity on the group. Otherwise, what I don't we know how we. How, I don't know how we do that. Um, Okay, I, I, I can. No more than one should be from the same party? Yeah. That wouldn't work in the Senate. If possible. I mean, <laughs> where possible. <laughs> I, I don't, we don't, this is the way I, we set up all, this is the way all, most all committees are set up, that they shouldn't be from the same political party. Right. Uh, That's pretty standard. I, I understand the argument. This is the way we've always done things. I just think this is might be a year to question that. And this might be a situation where we look at what we've Why? done in the past and it hasn't worked. Why? Why does that makes it even more political? That's like saying two parties, you know, that 
I, I mean, don't I think, think this should exist at all. I think it's already yeah. too political. I, I don't think the value of it. So I'm a no at this point. Well, I think you want people with also people who have interest and who have expertise in this particular area, not just people <laughs> who they belong to a certain party. Those words have been used very subjectively this session. So, Senator Rahm, I'm confused about your, um, is it your opposition to this particular oversight committee or oversight committees in general? Um, Probably, probably a little bit of both. I mean, we have some, I'm on two committees that have not met at all and have not. They're not oversight, not oversight committees. committees. Neither of those are an oversight committee. They're not oversight One's committees. One's called an accountability committee. So it's not, not no, sure wait, the point of that is. Calm down a little bit here. That is not an oversight committee. That's a very specific committee that's set up for a very specific purpose. And it, it isn't. It's not an oversight committee. Okay. And the other's an administration committee and I had right. to ask for us to meet. I, I, I thought you were on joint rules. Me? I, no. I thought you were on joint uh, legislative rules with me and Joe Benning. I thought that was judicial. Yeah, ju and judicial, okay. it's rules, okay. it's judicial rules. It's not administration. And that's okay. not an oversight committee. Okay. They're very so different. Are, do you think this is going to meet significantly more than those other committees? Because I haven't seen a lot of activity from other committees that have. Well, I can tell you why. I can tell you why a government accountability committee hasn't met because it's an off session committee and it met in December. So it, what, it hasn't met since then because it's an off session it, committee. It's written as an off session committee? Yes. Okay. So this, what is this written as? It, it's, it's primarily an off-session committee, but okay. it does say that it can be it can meet at the call of the chair during the session. Yeah, I mean, there are over. You know, the um, the state house management committee is an oversight committee. It oversees the management of the of the state house, just like legislative council is oversees the the workings of legislative council. Those are and they meet all you know with some degree of regularity. I, I, I just, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not, um, I, my thought was that everybody would like to have some more oversight over and input into what's happening with our retirement system. The whole conversation so far has been about why not have professionals and experts do it as far away from the legislature as possible. That's, and now this is the complete departure from that. It is, it is. This is, but this isn't having anything to do with VPIC or investments or um, anything else. That's all over there. This is saying the legislature needs to have more involvement. Beth keeps saying, and I, or maybe it was Tom, that this is this is ours. We need to yeah. own it. Yeah, if that's we, what I said in my first comment. Right. Beth has charged us with owning this more responsibly. Right, and this is ours GovOps and appropriation. No, this is the legislature needs to own this. GovOps is okay. one committee and we have a multitude of issues to deal with. So we have, if, if we wanna meet all summer long um, as a government operations committee and just look at, um, it would have to be the two committees though, the House and the Senate and just look at retirement, I suppose we could do that. That's too big for one thing, it's 16 members. And we, there is no way we can keep, I've been on this committee for a number of years and every year there are retirement issues come in. We have very limited time to deal with those retirement issues just as we have limited time to deal with other things. So having the input, from somebody who has been um, watching this and um, working with it and looking at it all summer long. And, and understands it more fully. I mean, it would be it, valuable. Uh, but but if the, it, it's okay, if we don't have um, agreement on it, that's fine. Anyway, it, we're getting to a bit to the, to the witching hour, maybe we all need to take a break. Yeah, I think I think we do. And the, what we need to do 
on tomorrow. And I'm hoping that we can wrap this up because if we don't wrap this up, we don't have a bill. It's as simple as that. So we need to make all the decisions tomorrow. So I, we're, tomorrow, what we're going to do is start at the beginning and go through it. And I know that people who aren't normally on this committee and watching us um, may not be uh, used to the way I like to do this, but I like to start with section one and make any changes and then just put a big red mark beside it that says we've all agreed or we haven't agreed and get it over with and then move to section two so that we're not going back and forth and back and forth. We're getting, we're agreeing with things. And if there are things that we don't agree with, then we'll come back to them. But we're gonna go through it sec part by part and just eliminate the things that we've already agreed with and move on. Does that make sense? We'll see how we do. And, and um, I would say we need to be, bring your pajamas because we need to, we need to get this out. If we, um, we, uh, I'm going to ask the rules committee to send it to us tomorrow, and um, we'll get it. And we have. My guess is that it'll have to. There'll have to be a conference committee on it. And so, if we won't, if we get this out on Friday, it won't get to the floor <coughs> until. Tuesday, and unless we can um, suspend the rules to advance it to all stages, it won't actually be passed by the how the Senate until Friday, Thursday or Friday, and then it has to go back to the House. So we are quickly running out of time. And I hate to say that, but we are, and hopefully we'll have something that we can agree on. So if I would suggest if anybody has any language changes for any of these that you bring them in tomorrow and that when we start going through them, we'll look at the language changes as we, as we progress through the bill. I guess I would just say, you know, what I'm hearing from you feels like as a principle, it's really hard to digest a huge new concept in 24 hours that would would not even really take place until next year. So for me, that's what this feels like is a pretty big new change that we're trying to figure out how does it fit with all the other changes we're asking for at the same time that we're saying it doesn't need to happen until next year. So that's just what I'm hearing. And I'm gonna sit with that one. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. I, I just, I was caught off guard because we have heard so much from so many people that we needed more oversight um, over our whole system. And um, so this was an attempt at a solution to give us more oversight. And that's all it was. And really keep our legislative toes to the fire and, 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 and give it the priority it needs. There aren't there that, there aren't that many oversight committees. So this really shines a light on our making this more a, a, a legislative priority. I think there's um, energy, um, technology, and correction, uh, ju justice. judicial, justice oversight, justice, not judicial, justice oversight. There's child, child, one to do with- um, Child protection oversight. Child yeah. protection oversight. And a, a couple, but there aren't, there aren't that many. Yeah. Okay. Can we do that? Yeah, I just also want to, I know we haven't talked about this in a couple of days, it seems, but if we're going to try to crunch things together in the next day or so, I want to make sure that people feel comfortable with the so-called balance on the both of the, the, the new commission and the task force, we, something we talked a lot about early on. Yeah, we haven't made any decisions about those yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Have a nice evening. All right. Thanks.